I'm closing for my niece today. Oh, you are? Yeah, my second niece. <laughs> oh, you've been selling, I remember when I first spoke to you, you said you were selling a lot to your family members, right? Yes, well, I'm one of 11, so they better give me business. <laughs> oh, wow, 11? <laughs> You're one of 11 brothers and sisters? Yes. Wow, that's crazy. I thought my parents had a lot of kids. Yeah, how, how many, many do you have? Five. Five? Brother? Yeah, two, we brothers, have two brothers and two sisters. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. yeah, it used to be different back in the day. Back in the day, you could have like a, a football team or a basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's two kids. It's like, all right, that's enough. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I have to three you, and it's too much. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. You know, it's funny is that Elon Musk said the biggest threat to humanity is that we're not having enough children. I don't know how, how Oh, true yeah. But you know what? Moms didn't work back then. Yeah. My mom said she had four kids, so she would have a bunch of grandkids, and none of us want to keep popping out kids. <laughs> Here goes that idea. <laughs> that's funny yeah you know what pretty soon our kids are gonna have to start working with all this inflation going on mm -hmm. true yeah Agreed. that's crazy um, the, dad, Agreed. The, kid, the kids are gonna have to start working at age 12 lemonade <laughs> or nine. nine very true very true all right i think we should probably be uh should be about right right now okay Lois, can you put on your agenda that one day we talk about Zillow and Open Door and their models? Zillow and Open Door, you mean the buyers? Uh, well, not actually on the buyer side. I'm just talking about showing a darn listing and um, why are people feeling that it's easier to list with them opposed to us bodies? Okay, so why are, okay, that's a good question. So what you're saying is why are people opting in to sell to corporations instead of selling to the, the traditional buyer? I mean, seller. I mean, no, 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 buyer, I'll just. Yeah. Uh, well, this, the thing is this, why do some people work for different real estate companies? You know, why do some people practice different religions? Why do some people live in Georgia versus Florida? It really just comes down to, to different personalities, mindsets, and the way that people are wired. The, the more we get into the new, I would say the new era that we're going into, people don't want to communicate with people anymore. Like, it, it feels like it's a, it's a burden to speak to someone because we feel like we're going to maybe get our arm twisted into doing something we don't want to do uh, or convinced by a salesperson to do something. You know, So a lot of times people opt in to just say, you know what, I don't want to meet anyone. I just want to buy my car online. I just want to buy my house online. I don't want to go with an agent. I just want to by listed myself like you know th that's kind of like where we're heading to but if you talk to like an older person i don't know who, who here has ever had an older client who has ever um, prospected and maybe spoken to older people mm -hmm. older people are the nicest people in the world and they'll talk to you yeah. with you because they're from a different era but you talk to you know um, millennials and down and they're like kind of like very standoffish and i feel like that's where our humanity is going where we don't want to communicate with each other anymore because we don't trust each other anymore. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So I think that's what's really giving way to a lot of these companies. What do you think, Belinda? Um, I, I think that's true. My biggest problem that I really had this weekend was showing those properties. I don't know if anybody <clears throat> had the experience where you got to call an 800 number and wait for a human now to answer the phone to help you make the appointment. And sometimes when you roll up on them, you don't have that time to sit on the phone for 45 minutes waiting for somebody to answer the phone to give you the lockbox code. Mm -hmm. and they're popping up, uh, open door um, is big in one of the counties that I, that I service. Yeah. And it's like, I really can't show the house because I can't get anybody on, in on the other line. So, so what you're saying is that open door, I don't know about Zillow. I think I've seen a Zillow listing before and they're not buying anymore right now, by the way, but I saw a Zillow listing once. I think it was, it was a pretty easy process to show, but you're saying that open door has a very difficult process to show their properties. They don't go through showing time. They don't have a no. set of procedures, a listing agent on it. No, nope. they Does have a listing agent on it, but you still have to call an 800 number. Okay. And that, and that listing agent is just a limited service agent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that's that's strange. Uh, has anyone else seen that? Because I haven't seen that yet. No. I did run across a company who did um, own, that owns a lot of properties, 
uh, they, uh, I guess they, they rent out properties and they have a, a very strange process of going about it too with these lockboxes and they're strange lockboxes too. They're not like regular lockboxes. They have like a two factor authentication lockboxes. They're really strange. They're not Supras, but you're, you're saying that you can't even get anyone on the phone. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, that's going to have to change. I mean, I think that over time, if uh, the board gets enough complaints, they're going to have to do something about it because that's mm-hmm. not obviously an ethical practice. And I'm sure that open door doesn't want to just have their home sitting on the market. They want to, they want to sell those properties. So it's an, it's an inefficiency. I think it's just a lack of experience that they've been in, in the market for so little amount of time that they don't have other procedures probably down to a science yet. They're, but they're, they're showing up everywhere in Georgia. Is that, is that a trend then? Yes. Uh, yes. It's funny that we was talked about trends last week and then I had to go out and show this weekend. And that is a trend I've seen. Um, a lot of open doors, a lot of open door. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, do you see open doors making offers on properties? Are you competing with open door buyers? Um, no, I ha- I haven't experienced that yet. Um, just a lot of yard signs up and I did some backtracking yesterday on those properties and to see if they were, you know, pre foreclosures or short sales. And yeah. according to tax records and little phone calls that I made, these are just really people that just wanted out of those properties. Hmm. Um, they weren't in trouble. Okay. All right. Well, um, mm-hmm. today, today we're going to cover a, a, a couple of things, a couple of uh, items. And, and I think that in the future, Open Door is going to be a, um, a competitor to us, and for sure. Uh, why, why do I say that? And good thing you brought that up too, Belinda, is because uh, very soon, you know, all these moratoriums are, are coming to an end. Uh, there's going to be a lot of inventory that's backlogged on, on the bank's books. People are not people are not able to catch up. People are not paying. And uh, we're going to see the influx of short sales coming back around. Now, I, I don't know if you guys have been in the market long enough to even know what a short sale is. So let me just explain to you very quickly. Because when I first um, heard the term, I almost thought that this was, first of all, just an impossibility. The bank will never go for it. And um, yeah, like no one even knew how to make heads or tails of it. I, I, the first time I ever heard about it was from an attorney friend of mine. Uh, he, he said to me, oh, they don't have enough money to pay for the house. Uh, they, they're going to be having to bring money to the table. Well, let's see if the bank will accept a short sale. I'm like, what? What's a short sale? He's, and he's telling me that, you know, sometimes when the, bar, the borrower can prove that they're in a financial hardship, the lender will, will give them a, a short payoff, which means that instead of paying off what they owe, they'll shorten the amount that they owe. Oh, for, for, for selling that home, if they can prove that they're in a financial hardship and the home is worth what it's being sold for. So that was the first time I think I, that was had to be back in like 2007, maybe even earlier, uh, really, really early on. And um, I said, that'll never, that'll never work. Come to find out a couple of years later, I was closing a hundred short sales a year. Like it, it was nuts. So that's going to happen again. <clears throat> Why? Because things are cyclical. Right now, short sales are not too commonplace. But at one point, you literally had to put on your listing not a short sale in order for people to want to show your home. Uh, because short sales a lot of times take twice as long, three times as long. I had short sales that took me two years to close on. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, they're very rewarding. You can make a ton of money working with short sales, but you can make a ton of money working on anything as long as you get good at it. So what I'm, what I'm letting you know right now is that <clears throat> this time around, I think the opportunity is going to be very difficult. Number one, because we have more, uh, we have more agents in, in the business now. We also have uh, Open Door, uh, Zillow's out of the game, but I think there's some other ones too that are that are buying homes direct. And you have you know big regional investors who also buy homes direct. So how does an agent compete <clears throat> with all of these um, new competitors that are entering the, the the space? How are we able to get a a share of that business or, or a piece of that pie? Well, I'll let you guys answer that first, because I know Belinda was telling me, why do some people sell the open door versus selling to a regular buyer? Now, why would why would people do that? Right. And we, we spoke about a couple of reasons why I think, you know, possibly people do that. But what could you offer a seller that one of these companies like Open Door couldn't offer them? What, what is it that you think you could bring to the table that an Open Door couldn't bring? There's no right or wrong. I want to see what you guys think. Service. Service, mm-hmm. right? Service. Good, good, good. Service. 
anyone else? Relationship. That's the word, relationship. These companies, uh, they hire people that they pay 15 bucks an hour. Do you think that they care about having a relationship with someone that they just met over the phone or maybe online? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But you, knowing that this person is going through a rough time, you could literally build a relationship with this person at their very uh, most vulnerable time. Because when, when someone's going through a hardship like this, you know, they kind of have their guard up. Because why? Because a lot of people are attacking them. A lot of people sending them, you know, um, letters to pay up collectors. And I'm sure it's probably not just their, their mortgage, maybe it's other stuff too. So inviting another person into the mix, you know, first of all, you got to find your way through because there's going to be a lot of people who are not even going to want to take your calls. They're not going to want to open the doors. So it's your job initially to figure out a way where you don't come off as one of those people. You, know, you have to you have to blend in as a friend and you have to almost blend in as like serendipitous meeting. You know, this is this was meant to be kind of way. So the way you do that is by offering advice, offering your service, offering expertise, just giving them the whole gambit of their options. Because people pick up on when you want to just sell them and when you want to just take their business and, they, and you just want to be able to make a buck off of them, people can tell. So your, your number one job, not only with just working with people who are in a distressed situation, but people in general, is you, you really genuinely have to come from a place of service. You have to help them and figure out what it is that they need, not what you need, but what they need. So what does that sound like when you start that conversation? Uh, does anyone want to give me like a, an intro or is, does anyone want to kind of run it by me? Maybe they've had a situation before where they've, they've helped someone way more than, than look for, looked out for themselves. Uh, hello, I did this. Yeah, Alejandro, I just, I just asked them, usually a distressed homeowner, is asking, what is your goal? Like, what do you plan to, do you want to stay in the, in the home? 99% uh, of them, they want to stay in the home. They're already on the water. Uh, so at this point, it's, it's, you know, maybe try loan modification. I know that doesn't give us anything, but um, that doesn't really work. That barely work, uh, yeah. loan modification. But when you already got all the paperwork for the loan modification, it's just easier to do a short term because you already got all the paperwork. Sure. Um, and if, if, if the loan modification is approved and, uh, you just help somebody. You don't make anything, but you just help somebody. Yeah, you help someone. <clears throat> Absolutely. You, you can help people and, and they'll come back to you. Don't remember that. Or they'll refer you to someone else. Uh, that, that happens very, very often. So one of the principles that has been, has worked no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you do, is uh, in order for people to, to care, they I mean, care about what you have to say, they genuinely have to think or feel that you care about them. So making sure that you come across that way is so important. I'm going to give you guys a quick story. Yesterday, I met a nice couple. Uh, they contacted me. Uh, they wanted to see this condo here in Naples. So I run over there with my, my daughter yesterday. It was so fun. Uh, we went over there together. She's, uh, she's uh, how old is my daughter? She's seven years old. And uh, she is like a bundle of energy. She's, just, she's the opposite of me. She's just talkative, hugs everybody. She's like very, very outgoing. So she wanted to go with me. So I took her. So we go to see the, uh, this condo, and uh, first time I ever met these people, really nice folks. Uh, it turns out that they already own another condo in that same development, and they, they're considering selling that one because it hasn't been renovated since they bought it. They bought it in the 80s, so it hasn't been renovated since then. So it's basically like walking into like you know time machine that you literally turn, uh, transport into the 80s. Uh, so they were looking at this one place, and I think the condo was going for like 329 or something like that. It was fairly inexpensive condo, but in those in that community, it was like it was one of the most expensive condos that was selling there. And it was all renovated. We took a look at it and it was literally a revolving door of people. There was a lot of competition for it. So after we got done looking at the place, you know, they asked me, hey, look, you know, you know, thank you for coming out. And you know, we just want to kind of give you our, our situation. We have another condo here and we want to and we want to purchase another one and but we want to sell ours first, but we have a tenant in there. What do you suggest that we do? I was like, well, that all depends. I'm like, you know, we would have to look at your condo and see what it's worth and see if it's, it makes sense for you to, to even sell it. Maybe you just renovate that one and keep it. So we went over to take a look at their condo right afterwards. They took me over there. I, I built a quick report with them. Uh, and they were like, maybe you can help us sell that one. So I went over it with them and I looked at the place and the place was immaculate, but it was from the 1980s, like really great shape. So they were like, what, what, what do you recommend that we do? I was like, well, I can't tell you what to do, but I, I told them I can tell you what I would do. What I would do is you don't own anything on this condo. The condo's in great shape. 
You've had the same tenant for 30 years. She literally treats the place like it's hers. I said, what I would do is I would refinance this condo, pull out 80% of the money, take that money, and then buy a condo with that. And they were like, why would you do that? that doesn't, you know, how, does that how, does that, how does that work? And I didn't even know you can take out money on your investment property. I thought it had to be your primary only. I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, it's literally better to do it this way. Because if you were to fix this place up, first of all, you're going to spend 75000 I said, if you spend 75000 you're going to get three twenty five. You can sell it as is right now for two seventy five, dollars and you'd make more money by just selling it as is, or maybe two ninety dollars even. So I was like, first of all, forget about renovating it. It's not even worth it. Either you give somebody a good deal, or you, or you do what I'm telling you. Refinance it, pull the money out. Why? Because if you were to sell it, you've owned this place for 30 years. You've already depreciated all of the depreciation out of this condo anyway, which means that when you go to sell this, you're going to pay a ton of capital gains, which means that you would literally walk away with less money if you sold this condo for 290 or 300 than if you were to just refinance it. Because when you refinance it, you don't pay any tax at all. So I told them, refinance the money out. You'll end up with more money in your pocket. Keep this asset. You've got a great tenant who treats the place like it's, like it's theirs and never calls you about anything. Raise her rent a little bit because you haven't raised the rent in God knows when. And um, now take that money and invest into another property. Now you've got two properties making you money. They were like, oh my God, we feel like we, we need to like compensate you somehow like for giving us these ideas. Like, you know, can you, can you refer us to a lender? Can you do like, you know, so much value that I gave them from just that one interaction that I know I've got their business. I said, listen, you don't owe me anything, but I hope I earned your business. And they're like, absolutely. Well, you know, we're, we're going to you know, buy with you. If we sell, we'll sell with you. We recommend you our friends. So what I'm, what I'm getting at and the story I'm trying to tell you here is that when you meet someone, always put their interest before yours. Because I could have told them, you know what, let's get the thing on the market. I got a buyer for it because there's like a laundry list of buyers that we can throw into there right now. There's so many people that are looking for homes. I could have just said, look, we could sell this thing tomorrow for 275. But is that the best option? Or is that the only option? So what I did was I gave them all the options. And if she had a problematic tenant, if she had a unit that was always breaking down, if she had like, um, I don't know, a development going up across the street that was going to lower the value of her house or the traffic was going to be insane, then I tell them, you know, get out while you can. But they literally had a great condo in a great location that is doing nothing but going straight up, you know, in value. So I gave them that option. And, and, in, and in return, I didn't get a listing yesterday. But I know down the road, if they ever do sell, they're, they're going to they're gonna sell with me. And that's how you build. And that's how you build a real estate empire, a real estate um, network. Uh, when I owned uh, the real estate company back in Jersey, I rarely, rarely, rarely did any um, prospecting to try to attract more, more business. I would, I would attract um, new investment business for myself. But as far as clientele, like as far as residential business, regular business, I rarely went after that. Why? Because I would have so many clients from the past that I serviced that way. They would just call me and just give me listings and give me, you know, uh, leads and give me this. And I suggest, you know, obviously handle it or take care or, or give it off to one of the agents. But because I did so, because I did right by so many people over the years, people remember that. So what I'm trying to get, get at with the story is that when you're going to deal with someone, especially someone that's in a bad situation, always make sure that you're looking out for them first, even though you know they're vulnerable. You know, it, it's, it's karma. You know, at the end of the day, you got to do what's right for them. You got to ask them, like uh, Alejandro was saying earlier, you know, tell me about your plans. What is it that you're looking to do? You know, is it, is it, uh, what kind of timeline on your on? Some people, they're just like, look, I don't want to save this place. I just want to get out. I don't want any money from this place. I just can't sleep at night because I know that I owe the bank 300,000 and it's only worth 200. You know, some people just want out quick and you'll have those people just like you'll have the people who want to save their homes. So you just go in with an open mind and just see what people are looking for. Now, how, how do you go about obtaining this information? This is something that I guess we can learn. How, how would we go about obtaining any, any type of information? What kind of a client do you want to go after? First of all, that's what you have to kind of come to a, a realization of what kind of a buyer, what kind of a seller, what kind of a client are you, are you looking? Um, so anyone here, can you guys tell me what is your ideal client? What is I, the I, I have a question. Yes, um, Louis, yes. I recently had a conversation with some someone about the same thing. Um, they actually have a, a townhouse in uh, Piscataway and they looking to relocate to South Jersey. So I asked them, do they need the equity 
in um out of the house in Piscataway in order for them to move. So they said no. So I was talking to them about, well, maybe they should rent it out and hold on to it. Yeah. But I like what you said about refinancing. In a situation like that, like when would you recommend them to refinance? I would re- I would only recommend them to refinance when they're okay being a landlord. Because a lot of people, they don't want to be a landlord. It's very stressful. Uh-huh. So if they're okay with being a landlord, if they're okay with, you know, obviously uh, maintaining a property that's, you know, going to be not a, a next door, then it's okay. But believe it or not, a lot of people that I propose that idea to, they're like, no, 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 we don't want to deal with with uh, with tenants. And that's okay. Not, yeah. not everyone's the same. Yesterday, I met a guy uh, who has, um, he has four families and six families in St. Louis. And I'm telling him, and I said to him, I was like, wow, you, you know, you must have a a bunch of headaches because I know I have a bunch of headaches with these rental properties. He said, no, not at all. I've owned them for 45 years. Never had a, never had a problem. Okay. So people are cut differently. You know, everyone has a pain tolerance personally, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I, I don't have, I don't have the patience for um, tenants all the time. I mean, I, I do most of the time, but sometimes I lose it because they're constantly, it's like, if it's not one thing, it's another, but some people don't care. But some people are like, you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. And some people don't do anything about it. So they're okay with it because they just let, you let the tenants, you know, cry for no reason. But obviously, you know, so when, when you, when you do something, you got to do it because you're going to enjoy, mm-hmm. enjoy the outcome. So Tammy, the, the, the right answer there is it's not for everyone, but the smart thing to do for them would be to figure out what they need in order to, to make their next move in their, in their life. If it's, they, if they need the money, well, they've got, they've got three options, right? Or they got two options. They can either sell their place, pull the money out and then buy another place, or they can refinance their place, pull the money out, keep it as a rental and then buy their next place, you know? And there's another option too that, you know, what, what they can do is they can do a, a bridge loan, which means that and I, some, not, not a lot of banks do this, but a bridge loan is, is basically like a bandaid. It helps them pull the money out of their house but only temporarily. So it helps them pull the money out of their primary home and it allows them to use that money to buy the next home. Now, the, the terms on the bridge loan are very good. They're usually very cheap because banks nowadays, what they wanna do is they wanna lend money because a lot of borrowers are getting beat out by cash buyers. So what they do is they give you a bridge, a loan on your primary. You use that money to put it as a down payment on your next home. And then meanwhile, you put that home that you just had the bridge loan on, on the market. You understand? So you can kind of pull the money out, do what you got to do, leave the house empty so someone can show it and sell it and then move on. Usually those bridge loans last for a year, two years, but I don't recommend that if the person um, doesn't have like, how would I say the ability to keep up on two mortgages? Cause they might have, you know, they don't, they won't have any mortgage payments on their, on their bridge loan. Usually what the bank does is they, they accumulate those interest payments and it's paid off at the, at the closing, but they may have a first mortgage on that house. If they have a first mortgage, then obviously they're going to have to carry two mortgages. Mm-hmm. So it just depends. So you've got options there. You know, you can see what the person may want to do. Okay. But my idol, you said, what's our idol client? Um, someone who is ready and willing and, you know, listen, <laughs> They listen to you and um, yeah, pretty much that. Someone that's really ready and willing is my ideal client. Okay, so that's your ideal client. How do you find those people? Well, I told you, um, you know, with the with the calendar, the questions that I ask, I kind of eliminate people that's not, that I don't want to spend time with. Cause I felt, I feel like, I, I spent a lot of time with unnecessary people and yep. I feel like if I didn't, I would have had more production. So yep. now my goal is to eliminate, eliminate them people and just deal with the ones that, you know, that's willing to do what needs to be done to get in a transaction. You know what I mean? If that Correct. makes sense. Yeah, and that's so- even with sellers too, because I have some sellers that just be playing around and I, I have to eliminate those too. Absolutely. So I, I love that. That's your, that's your process of elimination. But how do you feed that funnel? Where do those people come from? Do you have a Zillow ad? Do you have um, clients who refer you clients? Uh, I work my CRM. Oh, your CRM. Okay. You guys know what that yeah. is? 
Everybody? Okay, good. All right. KB Core. I started utilizing KB Core more because mm -hmm. I had a lot of people in my in my database from when I had the salon. Okay. And um, I neglected KB Core these how many years I've been with um EXP? Almost the first two years. years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now that I've been utilizing it, I make good contacts each day. Oh, so definitely. I circle prospect and I uh, utilize my CRM and I do social media marketing. So, but my CRM with KB Court allowed me to tap, in, tap, tap into my sphere I love that. and calling them on a regular. So KB Court guys is very powerful. I love that. You, yeah, you see, Tammy's not trying to reinvent the wheel. She already knows these people. She doesn't have to like say, all right, well, these were my hair clients and I can't approach them as my real estate clients. She doesn't care about that. So don't ever put up a wall for yourself or a boundary and say that you can't uh, because these people are going to, because I, it, you know what, let me, let me back track for a second. And uh, Shakita, I know you have a question. I'm going to get to you in one second. Okay. A lot of times when we're getting into this business, we're worried about what other people are going to say about us, which means that we have an identity crisis where maybe it used to be a teacher. Maybe we used to be a salon owner. Uh, I was a I was a barber and nobody gave me business in the first year because everyone looked at me as their barber. No one took me serious as a real estate agent. And that was an identity crisis for me. Uh, but as you stick, if you stick with something long enough and you are not scared and you're not shy about who knows about it because you love it so much, eventually people are going to see that. But if you're an undercover agent because you're scared that people are going to judge you because you're a real estate agent now. And like, Oh, look at her. She thinks she's hot stuff. Cause he's a real estate agent. If you think like that, that's exactly where you're going to get. You're not going to get anything positive out of the whole equation. You're only going to service the people who by coincidence find you. You don't want coincidence. You want everybody to know that you're in the business and you're ready to work with them. Um, now, Shakita, I think you had a question. You want to unmute yourself and see what you had to say? Hi. Um, I know you all are talking about idea clients. Yes. But I would like to know, when do you just give up on a client buying oh. a home from you? Because I'm nurturing two people, and one person decided that they want to live this place, and then later they said, well, I want this place, and, well, me and my wife is I think you had a, I think you had a similar question or concern like a week or two ago. And uh, I feel for you. Um, let me, let me have one of the agents uh, on the call kind of give you some, some, some direction on that. Do you guys, did you guys hear her question or hear her concern? No, no I don't, I'm, I didn't understand. Okay. So what, what Shakita is saying is like, when is it okay to let a client go? Because she has a client who wants a house here, then they want a house there, and they can't make up their mind. They're very indecisive. How well, would they're, you not how, how, they're not listening. They're not listening. I had a situation very similar to that. Yeah. And um, so the client wanted something she couldn't afford. She always believed that the, the price on the tag, like if the house was 385 she really wanted the house because it has the white cabinet, the stainless steel appliances, the finished basement. I went with her everywhere to three different counties. And I always told her we have to overbid. And she was like, okay, 15,000 more, 20,000 more. But those homes were always underlisted. And uh, the seller wanted 50K over asking. And then I got exhausted. So I had a heart to heart talk with her. I said, look, if you want the newer home, you have to get a town home because you can afford that or you're going to have to speak to your lender and get a stretch so you can afford what you want. And she said, no town home for me. She went back. She spoke to her lender. I was working with this client for one year. Uh, she got $80,000 extra on her pre-approval and we end up getting her the home of her dream. Nice. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was very exhausting. That is. Shakira, can I ask you a question? Yes. What do you think the problem with that client is? You know the client better than any one of us on the call. What do you think their problem is? They don't want to lose out on their money. They are looking to be invested. So they want to 
possibly buy and hold land in a specific area because that area is up and coming. Yeah. So what I did was I told them that, hey, I'm going to send you this big, long document, but just skim through it. So what it is is the development, uh, what do you call it, the, the development plan for a particular area. And lays out specific areas in which they want to um, create parks and tennis courts and all that good stuff. And I let him know that, hey, once you look at it, let me know what area you would like to um, think about more hmm? or go take a look at, and we can see if there's land available. I haven't heard back from. Okay. So I don't know what to do at this point. Do I keep on just pushing him uh, available land in my in the KB Core database, or do I just give up and say that he's not a serious buyer? Okay. How many times have you had to do this with them? How many times have you reached out to them about you know buying something, and how many times did they reach out to you about wanting to see more places? It's me reaching out to them all the time because initially. These were clients from Op City. That's how I got a hold of them. They're initially clients from where? Op City. Oh, Op City, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got a hold of them. Okay. And yeah. so I've been trying to work with them for the past uh, month or so, trying to find them land and possibly home in their price range. Okay. But on a scale of one to 10, what would you grade them as motivation? A three. A three, then I'd move on. I wouldn't even waste any more time. If they don't, if they're not if they're not a seven or better, I'm I'm moving on because you know why? During that time that you're that you're spending, that even that mind space that they're occupying in your brain, you could be doing something else. You could be doing something else much more profitable for you and uh, much more beneficial. Even if it's spending time with your family, it's better than worrying about somebody who's not worried as much as you are. So I always like to say that, you know, and I learned this from, from a lot of people around me, that you can only you can only meet someone halfway. You can't make them interested in something that they're not interested in. So what I would do is I put them on a drip campaign and I move on. You know, who here agrees or has maybe a different way they'd approach it? Yeah, I do something very similar. I, I kind of list them as like my tire kickers. You know, they're looking at properties all the time, but they never want to actually make the move. What I do with them is I put them in contact with all the pieces of the puzzle. Here's my lender. If you need a credit person, here's what I recommend. You know, here's my link to my website so you can search. And I'll also set them up on a drip campaign. If I notice that I'm sending them more properties on the drip campaign than they are looking at on my website, then I know that they're not putting as much effort in, you know, to the search that I am. And I kind of let them put the effort in before I make, uh, you know, my judgment call. But my time is very valuable. Um, and I think it was actually on one of these meetings that uh, somebody said, you know, view yourself as a $300 an hour employee. Because, you know, if you do a closing with someone, that's, you know, what your, your time should, you know, kind of cost if you're making $10,000, $11,000 on that closing. And if people are wasting your time, you know, there's mother, other more important things you could be doing. You could be grab, bagging groceries at the grocery store, handing out your business card. And that's, you know, more impressive or more important to you down the line than wasting time driving people around, you know. I have clients that come down, they, they say, hey, I want to live in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, or Naples. And I say, all right, great. Do yourself a favor. Come down here. I'll send you properties in three different emails, three different counties. Go spend a day in each of those towns and then call me back. You know, I'm not going to go out and spend time in those, those towns driving people around. You have to kind of make judgment calls. And then once they say, hey, I like this town, great. Let's go meet here and at the coffee shop and go look at properties. You know, your time is very valuable. Can I, can I say something? Please, please. Um, I do have a different perspective on it because I have learned that everyone is a mirror of me. So if I have somebody that is that I feel, um, as Stephen said, wasting my time, first of all, I ask, what it, was it in me that brought that on? And then I realized that the only reason why anybody would waste my time is because my expectations of them were incorrect and their expectations of me was incorrect. So then I sit down and say, what is it that you expect from me? I have that conversation because what I hear back could be something totally different from what they thought my job is. And once I learn what their expectations are of me, 
and they know what my expectations are of them, I never lose a client because now we're on a level field. And that's really all what it boils down to. They expect you to do something. You expect them to be a particular way. And you never had that conversation of what is it that I do and what do you expect from me? And that's probably a hard question that most of us have to ask. But if you ask a person what's their expectations of you, then everything's out in the open. True. And that uh, starts with communication. Uh, the, the better conversations and the better questions you have, the better answers you get. Lewis, what would you do if you yeah, feel so, somebody's wasting your time? Yeah, let me, let me, um, and, and, and right now, guys, it's hard to distinguish who's wasting your time because it's a, such a difficult market. It really is. And I feel for everyone on this call, I'm telling you right now, guys, it will pass. And we'll talk about that in, in just a second. But Shakita, this is what I'm going to tell you. There's a, what you're dealing with right now is the symptom. It's not your problem. Why am I saying that? The reason I'm, I'm saying that is because I'm going to give you an analogy before I give you my point. If you had to get across town, and you had three cars to pick from. One car had a flat tire. The other car was running on fumes, almost no gasoline. And a third car was brand new, decked out, had no issues, zero miles. Now, which car would you take if you had to get across town? You would take the car that can get you there. Is that correct? You wouldn't right. take the car with a flat tire. You wouldn't take the car with low gas. Because why? Because you had options. You had options to pick from. And if you have options to pick from, you pick the best option to get you where you're going to go. Because if you take the car with the flat tire, it may get you there halfway and then leave you halfway. The car with low gasoline may get you three quarters of the way and you get stuck on the side of the road. So what I'm telling you is that sometimes when we're dealing with clients, they're the same thing. If we only have one client to pick from, we only have one car to pick from, and that one car has a flat tire then we feel obligated to want to take that car to where we're going, where we feel obligated to work that one client because it's all we've got. The problem is not that you've got a client who is not motivated. The problem is that you don't have enough clients in your funnel. If you had more clients in your funnel, you'd mm -hmm. pick the ones that are going to get you there. You wouldn't worry about the ones that are not ready yet. Like Steven says, you put those people in a drip campaign, you let, you let the system handle them, and you focus on the ones that are ready to go. You understand? So I think that what you need to focus on is how can I get more people in my CRM? What I would, what I would encourage you to do is um, go through your entire phone directory, go through all your contacts and your emails, go back. I don't care if you got to go back two years and all the emails you've ever sent and then make a list of people that you haven't spoken to in a while. And the next week, the next seven days, spend an hour a day calling people that you haven't spoken to in the last couple of months and see how much more business you have. If you keep doing that every, every week, you spend an hour a day, an hour a day, an hour a day. I'm not telling you to, I'm not telling you to change your life. I'm not telling you to stop doing, you know, the things that you enjoy doing. I'm just saying, sacrifice one hour that you'd normally be wasting with someone who's not yet ready. And I use that word wasting probably correctly, but, you know, substitute that hour and call people you haven't spoken to a long time and see if you can dig some business out of them. Now, don't call them and say, hey, you got any business for me? Call them and just ask them how they're doing. Talk to them like if they, you know, obviously are, are a friend or if they're a family member and just and just let them know what you're up to. Ask them what they're up to. And, and somehow, some way, let them know that, hey, I'm here. I'm open for business if you know anyone or if you have any need for, you know, an agent, you know, I'm here for you. Shakita, I think that, um, let me just... Shakita, I think that that would um, go a lot further for you because I think what you're trying to deal with right now is, is the symptom and, and not the cause. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Oh, good, good, good. All right, good. So um, your assignment for this week is uh, get uncomfortable, uh, spend an hour a day making phone calls. You don't even have to call people you don't know. Call people you know who you haven't spoken to in a while, who you think are, are beneficial for your business, and just um, see if you get any, any new clients out of that who are more ready, willing, and able than, than the ones you're currently working with right now. And after you start making some money, you start closing some of these deals, take 10% of everything you make and reinvest it back into yourself. Spend some money on Zillow, spend some money on Facebook, spend some money on anywhere that you think would be a good place for you to, to if you think that that's maybe not your way to go, buy postcards, send them out to the neighborhood, start branding yourself to the areas you want to work in, but invest in yourself that way you can get more people back into your, into your funnel.
Um, Louis, I have a question. Yes, sir. So, well, first of all, thank you. The magnets came out so nice. Oh, great. Uh, I'm for glad the cards. Yeah. Very, very nice. I did mail out the letters last week. I want to stay consistent with those 12 homes. What's next? Should I send CMAs? CMAs? People yeah. love to people love to know what their houses are. No, people love to know what homes have sold for in their neighborhood. So if you're gonna send out, um, if you're gonna send something out, I would say that um, just a, a flyer would be good with this month's sales in that area. And that, only only from EXP, of course. No, right? no, no, no. That information is open to anyone. Okay. Yeah. Any. I mean, you're not even if a home just listed, you can send it out to them, but you wouldn't say introduced by or presented by EXP. But okay. I would just send him a, a flyer with the recent solds. I, I know a guy who does that in back in Jersey, and that's all he does, and he crushes it. But he does that every month. Okay. Um, what about chocolates for Valentine? I don't know. What do you guys think? Would you feel okay eating chocolate that showed up at your house? It's wrapped. Hey, hey, it will hey, be look. wrapped. <laughs> What's up, Blue? Hey, hi. how you doing, buddy? <laughs> I just want. I'm good. Yourself? Amazing, brother. Thank you for joining us today. I just wanted to see if I could add any value for. The topic that we're discussing yeah so i think it's really important like uh i think someone mentioned on the group chat that you qualify the buyer before you even take them out you got to make sure that they're qualified with a lender mm -hmm. more importantly that they're comfortable with their monthly budget um if they're telling you they don't want to speak to a lender they don't want to get qualified right now that's a red flag for you number one number two if they are serious they're going to say they're going to be happy that you're going to set them up with a lender and then once you find out what their budget is, not just what they're qualified for, they'll appreciate that as well. That, listen, I'm not just trying to sell you at your maximum amount. I want to set you up with a lender so we could tailor fit that loan to what you're comfortable with that monthly payment being at. So you can still take vacations, still go out to eat. People will appreciate that. So you got to bring value. Um, also, like Lewis had mentioned, you can't just be having one client. I remember when I was at Culture with Lewis, I have four deals in December of whatever it was, 2018, um, that were, have four deals set up. I'm, I'm, I'm like, this is going to be a great Christmas. All four deals died. And I remember saying to myself, you know what? From now on, I don't give a shit if 10 deals die. I'm still going to be good. And I just kept putting things into my, my, my funnel, like Lewis said. And, and, the, and the way to, an easy way to do that, that doesn't cost you any money it'll cost you time, is doing open houses every weekend. That's a perfect opportunity for you to meet people face-to-face, -face, for you to connect with them, that I tell my team, my motto used to be for myself before I formed the team, when I do an open house, I got to get five or 10 leads, right? Sounds great, right? And then I simplified it to just one lead every weekend. That's four leads a month. How would that change your life? Four leads a month. Let's just put that average at $7,000 of closing. That's 28 grand a month. So this stuff is not hard, but I believe in old school of going out there, connecting with people and get one lead a week. Go on EXP. There's a ton of top producers. You could say, hey, I want to do open houses. Anyone got open houses I could do? And just do open houses and get leads every single weekend. It costs you two hours of your life on a Sunday. And you get to connect with these people. They get to see you. Tell them about who you are. Tell them on how you don't have a ton of clients, how you'll dial into their needs. It's really, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a job interview. That's what an open house is. It's mm -hmm. not to sell the house. If you sell the house, it's a bonus. It's to, it's to get more leads. So I think, I believe more in that than Zillow, which you can't see what they're giving you. They mm -hmm. could be shit leads yeah. at an open house. The majority of the time, if you're qualifying the buyer, when you come in, Hey, did you come off the sign or Hey, did you come off Zillow? No, I came off Zillow. I'm pre-approved, blah, 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 blah. Now you're qualifying the buyer in person then over the phone. Yeah, I agree. That's good. Um, it's, it's I just want to add to that. That's great advice, Harry. When I first started, um, I used to do open houses every week. And I was able to get a lot of leads. However, my follow-up wasn't good. So that's why I missed out. And then when I did follow up, they'll be like, oh, I already purchased. So you definitely get great leads from open house, but you, you need a follow-up system with that. 100%, Sam. 
So Harry, it's funny you mentioned that story in, uh, about your December. I literally had that happen to me this December. And uh, I thought, you know, I was like, oh, this real estate thing is crushed for me. Like maybe I'm just not good at it. And uh, I came back to have a very strong start of my uh, my 2022 with uh, a, a very big deal. So, I mean, just keep staying consistent. And, and you know, like you said, things will happen. Um, the, other, the other thing too... Uh, is I've been trying to reach out to EXP agents down here. It's not as easy, I guess, as, um, or maybe I'm doing something wrong. I haven't been able to get an open house. Maybe I just haven't been so consistent about it, but like once a month I pop into EXP world and say, Hey, I'm looking to sit open houses and I haven't had anybody reach out. Um, is there another strategy that that might work besides like calling, you know, people that are in EXP and, and trying to do it on the, uh, on the world? Can I suggest something, Steve? The work group. Yeah. Work group, not the world. You should go to work. Group. Yeah, the yeah, that, that, that's it. That's what you meant, the workplace? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, what I would suggest is um, instead of reaching out to EXP agents, if it's, it hasn't been working out for you, uh, reach out to for sale by owners and tell them, hey, listen, I, I'm, I'd like to host a free open house for you guys, no strings attached. Yep. Okay. I, I was doing that as well when I was calling open houses uh, or first out by owners. And, uh -huh. and that was kind of my approach. Um, I, I, had one, I had one person that said they would call me back and they never called me back. And then I kind of just dropped the ball on it. I was like, oh, this is not really working for me. Um, and I found something else that was working a little bit better. So okay. what is working for you? Um, so right now I'm basically just uh, beefing up my KV core. Um, I have paid leads coming in through Facebook. Um, I think it's the make it rain campaign. Okay. Um, and then I'm also going through all of my contacts. I've literally just been calling random people like, Hey, uh, I'm a realtor in Miami. Now, if you know anybody moving down, let me know, or if I can help anybody down here and I'm from New Jersey. So the amount of people that I know, or that know someone that is moving down or has recently moved down, unfortunately for me is, is great. Um, so I'm developing a lot of connections that way. And I'm just getting out um, in Miami. I, the past three deals I've done have been people that, you know, I've met at the beach or at a bar right. or wherever, just from being out and like being who I am, you know, personable, having business cards on me. Um, I started doing stacks of 10 uh, and clipping them in like a little butterfly clip of business cards. And every day, you know, if I'm going to the park or going outside to the beach or whatever, I'll take a clip of 10. And that's my project to meet 10 people or hand out 10 cards, you know, leave them in, in places. Uh, I also put my barcode on my business card. And I noticed a lot of people are scanning that as soon as I hand it to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting a lot more um, people coming into my KV core, whether they're ready to buy or I meet them now and, you know, they're ready to buy later. I'm at least keeping in contact with them keeping out you know, property alerts, market updates for where the areas they're looking at, keeping them engaged. So they're constantly seeing my, my face. Yeah. Um, and I'm at the point now where I have so many people on my website and they're not answering the phones, but they're looking at all these properties. And I know that the tide will turn eventually and eventually they'll see something or they'll be ready and they will pick up the phone or they will you know, answer. Um, so I'm kind of just waiting for some of those chips to fall again, but I think I'm in a good spot right now. Um, and, and just getting out and, and being personable. Um, I happen to close like a $3 million deal or, or about to close, um, from somebody I met at a bar, you know, just talking to people. So, you know, the, the places that you go, just make sure that everyone knows when you're there, I'm a realtor, whether it's the beach, the restaurant, you know, wherever you want. Yeah, of course. I'm not sure if you got cut off, Steve. Yeah, that's 100 percent true, man. Let everyone know what you're up to. I always tell people when I go to the gym or wherever I'm at, I start conversations. Brody, get down. Um, hey, how are you? Start mingling. What do you do for a living? You know? And then I wait for the opportunity, like, well, I let them talk and tell me about themselves. What do you do? Brody. I'm a top producer and realtor. What areas do you cover? Well, I have a team. We cover most of New Jersey. I had a conversation I forgot about over two years ago. I gave the guy's card, uh, my card to him. It was at my uh, my son's soccer game. He just called me to sell a property in Elizabeth. And I was like, listen, I'm also an investor. I can make you a cash offer or put it on the market. You'll probably get more on the market, but you might run into some headaches. And 
you know, I, I, I think he wants to sell it to me cash instead of taking a listing. Now I could take a hundred grand in my pocket, you know, but these are planting seeds all over. And I try to tell Liz that because she's a little more reserved than me. Every single conversation you have throughout the day, you have to let people know what you're up to. When I go to the gym, my brother laughs. He's like, here comes the mayor, Harry. He knows everybody. I've only been going a lifetime for not even a year. I know everybody in there and they know exactly what I do. There goes the page group. I let people know a shy realtor is a broke realtor. That's what I learned in the training early on. A shy realtor is a broke realtor. So I knew I didn't want to be broke. So I'm not shy about what I do. I wear hoodies that have me and Liz on the back. Wherever I go, I wear the same shit over and over. And it's because I'm branding myself. I'm letting everyone know what I'm up to. I, I blew off fireworks. My na- it went my neighbor's built-in pool. It changed the color of his pool. He came over to my house. This is a military guy, big. And he was pissed off. And I said, listen, I had no idea it went in your pool. I'm, I'm really sorry. How can I make this right? I'll, I'll get your pool clean. And then we start talking. He's telling me how he's ex-military. I'm telling him I'm a realtor. He had enough of New Jersey's rules and regulations. He calls me up and goes, I want to sell my house. And I, and I, and I, I shared this before on this meeting. I was like, is it because you have an asshole neighbor that blew off fireworks? And he started laughing. We sold his house. We just set the highest comp for ranches in Middlesex. Like every, every conversation every day should be like, how can I put this food on the table? How can I let someone know what I'm up to and be genuine people. Don't be salesy. Just be real on who you are. Be authentic. People pick up on that. Yeah, unless you're not proud about what you're doing. Can I say something? Go for it. Hi. Hi. How's everyone? Great. We're better now that you're with us. Uh, I've been on the whole time. It's just that I was driving to work. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I just want to say, Harry, you know what? You made a great point, and that really stuck with me. A shy realtor is a broke realtor. And I'm realizing now, because I am I was a very, very, very shy individual, like afraid. When we was talking about fear, I had that same type of feeling. So <laughs> so um, with that being said, I'm going to, you know, break out my shell a lot more. Um, so thank you for those words of encouragement. And that is definitely going to stick with me because I definitely don't want to be a broke realtor. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> All right. I had a meeting last week with uh, with with my uh, team, and we had this uh, speaker on Quintavious. I can't remember his last name, um, but he's a really really awesome guy. I think he sold three hundred homes in his third year of real estate, um, and he gives himself a point system. If you Google him, um, you know Quintavious Realtor, you'll probably find him on YouTube. Gives himself a point system every single day, like it's a game. Uh, whether it's handing out 10 business cards or talking to one person, whatever you're comfortable with, set up a point system and get to your four points every single day. Um, you know, so one of my things is handing out cards. You know, I got to hand out 10 cards and I don't leave the park until I hand out those 10 cards. Set some you know, points for yourself for your day. And every day is a new game, basically. That's awesome. And not doing it alone, too, it helps big time. If you have someone to do it with, it's always fun. More fun. Doing it alone, <clears throat> doing it alone is just a. It, it, you've got a you've got a expiration date if you're doing it alone. So if anyone here feels like they're ever alone doing it, uh, please reach out to us. Reach out to me. Reach out to anyone you feel comfortable with in the group, and just let them know how you're feeling because doing it alone is just a recipe for disaster, guys. We're, that's why we're a group. That's why we're a team. Uh, just know that we, we've all been through it before. If you've been through something, I'm sure someone, one of us has, has been through it before. So don't be shy if you guys ever feel like you're going through a rough patch. All right, I'm going to share one last thing with you guys, and then we're going to call it a day. So, um, I, you know, I guess the, the, the tone and the, the real moral of this meeting today has been like, you know, things are going to work out eventually as long as you you, you, you move forward. Uh, coincidentally enough, uh, yesterday at uh, my church, we actually covered the same thing. And I'm going to share with you guys a story that my pastor shared. And uh, I'm going to share with you guys a, uh, a uh, verse out of the Bible that actually uh, coincides exactly with what we're talking about today. So my pastor was telling, telling us that he had, a, he had a friend who, um, for his 14th birthday, instead of going to Disneyland, he wanted to go to the Holy Land. He wanted to go um, 
out to Jerusalem. He wanted to go and, and see Nazareth. He wanted to go and experience that. So he told his father that he wanted to go there for his 14th birthday. And his father said, oh, that sounds, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. That sounds like something that, you know, would definitely benefit you culturally and something I think you should go and do. But the father said, only in one condition. The son says, what is it? But you got to figure out how to pay for it yourself. So the guy, you know, the kid's 14 years old. Uh, he might even have been younger. I think he might have been 12. But I think I think it was 12 or 14. I forget, I forget the exact I think it was 12. So imagine being 12 years old and your father telling you that you got to figure it out. You got to you got to figure out how to make two thousand dollars to go to Jerusalem. And the kid was like, OK, if that's what I got to do, that's what I got to do. So the kid starts hustling watermelons on the side of the road, starts cutting lawns, starts delivering newspapers and does everything he, he could possibly think of. And six months go by and he goes back to his dad and says, dad, um, I, I, um, I failed. I, I wasn't able to raise the $2,000. I, I was only able to raise 1200. And the father goes, well, that's okay. And he says, well, why is it okay? And uh, the father tells him, because as soon as you and I made this agreement, I told someone at the church that you wanted to go to the Holy Land and that we made an agreement that if you can find a way to pay for it, that, that it would be OK. And uh, the, the gentleman at the church says, well, whatever your son can't raise, I'll cover the difference. And so the son says to the father, so you've been you, you're telling me that this whole time you knew I could go, but you never told me and you never told me that the money was there if I couldn't raise it. He's like, yeah. He's like, why didn't you tell me? He's like, you literally prayed with me, cried with me, like you, everything, and you knew the whole time? He's like, yeah, I knew. He's like, but, but why? He's, and, and what do you think, why do you think the answer was, guys? Why do you think that the father never told the son that he was good to go, no matter how much he made? To keep him encouraged. Right? Yeah. Keep him <laughs> invested in the plan. Keep him invested. Uh -huh. Anyone else? He wouldn't have tried. He wouldn't have tried. tried. He wouldn't have. He wouldn't have put his best foot forward. He wouldn't have become a better version of himself if he didn't try. Because if the father told him, "Look, someone at church just said that they got you if you don't raise the difference," do you think he would have did any of the stuff that he did to read the twelve hundred? No. Yeah. Well, no. that's how spoiled brats are developed. <laughs> exactly. Well, the moral of the story, guys, is that if you think that that father acted in love. Do you think that father acted in love or do you think that father acted in a sneaky, mischievous way? I think in love. love. In love, right? Yeah. So yes. if you think about it, God does the same thing with us. God doesn't just give us what we ask for. God makes us work for it. We have the easy job. We have the easy part. We plant the seed. God grows the tree. We put it. the first step. God provides it, provides it away. But if we never take the first initiative and we don't, continue on that path we just wish our way there is never going to work you know god makes an agreement with us that if we try and we give it our all he'll make it work you'll find a way right harry it seemed impossible for you to become an agent when you left your trucking job but harry made it work you know there were times when harry wanted to give up there were times where a lot of us wanted to give up times where i wanted to give up times where i wanted to cry and just say you know this is not for me but you keep you keep on the path that you want. God will help you find a way. And uh, yeah, let me just show you real quick a quick um, share a quick picture. I took a screenshot of um, this verse in the Bible. It says, "At the right time, I, the Lord, will make it happen." You see, it's perfect. It's fitting for what we're talking about today. And I think that all you guys can walk away with knowing that no matter what you hear in any inspirational book or inspirational podcast. It, it's all been written, guys. There's nothing new under the sun, and all of us can um, all of us can believe that from the highest power that as long as we do it, God's got our back, and, and and He'll be there with us. So if we don't try, if we're scared agents, we're broke agents, it's because we're not really trying. You know, we cannot blame it on anything other than ourselves. We cannot blame it on I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm too white, I'm too black. It doesn't matter what it is, because we can all come up with an excuse and why it's not happening for us. But has someone in our position made it happen before? Guys, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a park where there were guys having a tournament, a tennis tournament in wheelchairs. Wow. In, in wheelchairs. These guys were in wheelchairs and they didn't make an excuse that I can't play tennis because I'm in a wheelchair. Literally had, I think it was like 
I want to say like 10 or 12 full tennis courts with guys playing doubles. And I'm like, where did he find all these guys in tennis, uh, guys in wheelchairs that like tennis? And these guys could have all said, I'm in a wheelchair. Uh, I'm, I'm giving up. I don't want to do this. You know, like I'm miserable, but they did it. So if they can do it, if they can play tennis, why can't you? You know, I'm not telling you guys to go play tennis, but I'm just giving you an example. It's never making excuse. So that is our message for today. Does anyone want to add anything to anything we spoke about today? Accountability. That's all. Accountability. I'll add, since we talking about the spirit. Yeah, go for it. One of the things that I go by is like the witness of the spirit. So if I get anxiety or in uncertain, I'll just stop. And um, if nothing, I'll just wait and keep seeking God. And when I have peace and power, I know that's the Holy Spirit telling me it's a green light and I just go. Yeah. So if you implement that in your business, you will know like how to eliminate certain people. Because if you anxiety or you uncertain about someone, just stop, mm -hmm. you know? And if, um, you know, and if you unsure, just, you know, just keep seeking other clients until you know, but then when you get them people that give you peace and power, just go with them. So I just wanted to leave you guys with that. That's amazing. Thank you for that, Tammy. Tammy says that faith without work is dead. Yep. If you, if you have faith, if you have faith, the guy can make it happen and you just got to put the first few steps and he got the rest. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Anyone else want to add before we go? All right. Guys, cool. guys, with me, I'm sorry. Um, oh. Don't oh, forget Ivania. Yes, Ivania. The event is Friday at 2 p.m. I send the details on the, on the crew email. And it's also on Instagram. Yeah, guys, if you could share it, share her event with anyone who you think may want to go. It, it could be obviously someone uh, who's not even in real estate, if they're considering getting into real estate or someone who you think would be a, a good fit for eXp. If you guys know people from other agencies who you've been trying to attract, this is a really low key way of doing it. You can say, hey, guys, we're going to go. Um, you can just call them and say, hey, we're going to go have lunch. Uh, let's go have lunch. This lady's doing an event. It's, um, you know, obviously it's a um, uh, what, what do you call it? Self-development. And then they're going to talk about, uh, you know, obviously a couple of the sponsors there. So a good way to get them into a, a comfortable atmosphere. Is that correct, Ivania? Yes. And I just posted the link on the chat for anyone. Yeah, the here. link's in the chat, guys. And I'll be there too. I'm coming down to uh, Jersey this week. So if you guys want to hang out, I'll be there. All right. Let's go ahead and close. Oh, one, one last thing. Uh, Hamoudi's on the call. I say, everyone say hi to Hamoudi. He's my, uh, if you guys don't know who Hamoudi is, he's uh, the gentleman responsible. Oh, Hamoudi. Hi, hi Hamoudi. How are you guys? Been quiet today. <laughs> By the way, I've been enjoying to listen to the conversation. It's a great conversation. But I learned something last week from John Kaplack. He's a big coach. He's probably like number one coach for real estate. And the difference between the elite people and regular people, it's some people, they just start, stop and go, stop and go. The elite people, they always go. They don't have a stop and go, stop and go. And life will always something on the way. You know, sometimes you make calls, you get frustrated, and you give up. The elite people is never give up. They're always going. Even if it's slow, but we're always going. But the conversation is one is great, and I'm excited to see everyone. That's amazing. And uh, Harry, congratulations. I know it's your wedding. You know, I'm sorry I cannot make it. Mike, she's <laughs> traveling. But I'm sure we'll see you guys again. Thank you, Hamoudi. Absolutely, man. Yeah. If anybody have a question or need anything, I mean, you can share my number. You know, I'd be more than happy to help. Thank you, Hamoudi. I appreciate you being here with us, brother. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. All right, guys, that's how you close out. Dear Lord, Father, we thank you so much, our Lord, for all the blessings that we have in our life. Father, we thank you for having this abundance of people who are willing to listen to the information that you've given us, the opportunity to, to absorb today. And Father, like your word says, Father, at the right time, you will be there and you will make it happen for us. We trust and we believe and we have faith, Father, that you are the perfect partner and you are the person who's guiding our every step. We ask you, Father, to keep us healthy and safe and protect our family until we meet here once again next week, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.
Take Have care. a great week, everybody. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. And uh, Chris, uh, have Chastity. a good day, everyone. Chastity, this is a Thank you. every Monday. You're welcome to join us every Monday. We're here at nine o'clock. If you want to contact me directly about finding out about our team as well, you can always <clears throat> email me at lewis at culture.estate, or you can reach me on uh, the meetup group if you're from the meetup group. Take care, everyone. Hey, Lewis. Hey, Lewis. It's, uh, it's Miriam. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you could. Have you could have um, add me to the meeting list. I oh, only yeah, sure. get the meeting through Google. Can you um, can you put your email address into the chat and I'll add you? Sure. Thank you. Okay. No problem. No problem at all. Sorry. Hi. Was that culture? C U L U T R E. Yeah, it's C U L T U R E. Yeah. I'll put I'll put it into the chat right now. Uh, Chastity. Thank you. How did you find us? Was it a meetup? It was on Meetup, yeah. All right, cool. But That's I'm cool. in Maryland. Are you guys Are you? all in Jersey? Um, no, there's some of us in Jersey, some in Georgia, some, oh, Berlinda's in Georgia. I'm in Florida. There's a few of us from Florida. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're expanding. We're trying to get to different places. Cool. Yeah. How do you like, how do you like uh, real estate? Have you been in in a while? Oh, I did something one second. Um, actually, I'm not an agent. I'm here to learn more about oh, nice. realtors. <laughs> So, yeah. Is that something you're interested in doing as a career? Um, actually, just to service you guys. So oh. I'm just going to be a fly on the wall and oh, cool. listen and learn. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, you have my email address. You can contact me whenever you have any time or you want to chat about something. I'm always there. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Take care, sweetie. Bye-bye. Hello. Hello. This is Sophie. How are you? Hey, Sophie. Um, Miriam's already in our group. Um, I don't know why she says she's not getting them. I just try to add her, but she's already there. Oh, Miriam? Okay. Well, maybe you went to her spam. Yeah, she's with me in my house. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I just added her again, and it says I can't add her because she's already a member. Oh, okay. Good. I have a question. Um, sure. How long are you going to be staying um, after Ivania's uh, thing? Uh, I think I'm going to be there for Friday to Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, can, yeah. I, can you have like 15 minutes to spare? To, uh, sure. Are you going to Ivania? Ivania's thing? Huh? Are you going yeah. to Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll hang out. I'm going to be there. Yeah, because uh, we're trying to do a little podcast oh, for nice. new realtors and for, um, you know, everyone who is kind of not knowing where to go with their um, real estate career and stuff like that. We want to make like a safe space podcast and integrate a bunch of different women from different fields that can communicate with each other and be resources to each other. I love that. That's awesome. So I, we figured um, who best to record or our first guest would be you. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. I'm going to introduce you guys to a girl named Kelsey too. She's in the, in the real estate industry. She's in the mortgage side. She's an amazing, uh, very inspirational uh, person. I think you'd want to interview on your podcast. Here in okay. Jersey? Yeah, she's from Jersey. She's a Jersey. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lou. No worries, guys. I look forward to seeing you guys. Take care, okay? Likewise. Yeah, you too. See Take you care. Friday. Bye.